um, uh, if you could all mute yourself uh, whilst uh, the speakers are speaking and also if you could uh, turn your camera off uh, when the speaker is speaking as well that will be helpful in terms of just uh, reducing any distractions uh, we are recording this event all slides and a recording of the event will um, eventually go on the Community Energy London website, communityenergy.london. Um, and uh, we will be uh, having a short Q&A after each speaker, just for any immediate quick questions or clarifications on slides, points raised, and a kind of plenary Q&A at the end, I'm guessing something around about 11.30. What have I forgotten, Jess? Anything else? No, I think then we'll just introduce our speakers this morning. As I mentioned, for those who've just come in, my name is Syed Ahmed. I'm the chair of Community Energy London. I'll be talking a little bit more about CELL as we go through this morning's event. And across my screen, uh, let me introduce our, our first speaker, Dave, if you just want to say who you are, Dave Powis. Hello, I'm Dave Powis, Director of Home Energy Action Lab based in North London in Hackney. Um, and project manager for a report on the potential for air source heat pumps in community buildings, which you'll hear from later. And Dave, you might want to say why you might be pulled away from the screen this morning, because you're 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 walking the walk, aren't you? I am. I'm project managing a solar install, so I'm doing that as well at my own house here. So I might have to dash out and show the the amazing contractors they're Hackney based as well to the roof. Perfect. Cheers. Thank you for that, Dave. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Kieran Sinclair. Kieran. Hi, I'm Kieran Sinclair. I am the policy manager for Heat Networks at the Association for Decentralised Energy, which is the trade association that covers uh, the UK heat network sector and also some other bits and pieces. Cheers, Kieran. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to have the Association for Decentralised Energy here today. Uh, to talk about heat networks and hopefully expand a little bit a bit uh, more on that kind of heat decarbonisation agenda. Uh, our, further, our final speaker this morning is Tanuja Pandit from Power Up North London. Tanuja. Morning, I'm uh, Tanuja, uh, a director of Power Up North London, and um, we're delivering renewable heat project, uh, a renewable heat project at Caxton House, which is the one I'm going to focus on today. Um, besides that, a lot of what Power Up North London does is around rooftop solar installations and also some um, fuel poverty advice uh, to people. Signing up. Thank you, Thank you Tanuja. Okay, so our, our focus this morning is very much about decarbonisation of buildings. We focus upon one particular technology route through our report, but we're really, <clears throat> excuse me, um, welcoming um you know uh, duncan's input as well into the world of heat networks and um some major significant regulation that the government will hopefully be introducing over the next six months to a year which kieran will be talking about which is highly relevant for london in terms of the urban environment and the built the built environment in london so um on the heat network relation i think that's particularly interesting um i think i'm the first up aren't i jess so Kieran, Dave, if you want, I'm turning in for cameras. Kieran kicks, um, sorry, um, Jess, kickstart the slides and uh, we'll go through um, the kind of background to some of the work that Cell is doing at the moment, which I hope will be of interest to people. So. Yep, so that's our event title, uh, Decarbonising Heat Through Community Energy. Uh, and uh, as we've just gone through, that's the running order after myself will be Kieran, then Dave giving some of the outputs from uh, the study that we're currently undertaking, and Tanuja providing some input on, um, you know, a real world case study of a, a community group trying to install a heat pump in a building. And finally, uh, my colleague Jess, who's the project officer at Community Energy London, forgive me Jess, we didn't give you a proper introduction at the beginning of the event, but she'll be ending up talking about our new peer mentoring program which Community Energy London launched last week and which we can provide uh, free expert advice to community groups for their projects and uh, we, we thought we'd end up with the meeting just highlighting that program uh, which has again just been launched. Please do go ahead. Uh, thanks Jess and just to say uh, uh, if you can put your name and affiliation down if you have any affiliation in the chat column 
I'll be monitoring the chat after each talk and uh, we'll be trying to answer questions through that route as well. So if there's any points in clarification or immediate questions, do feel free to pop in the slide, please. Okay, so that's it. Community Energy London has been looking at a number of different interventions around trying to decarbonize London uh, for some time now. And as the agenda has increasingly been turning on heat over the last couple of years, uh, we've been, uh, well, I should say, CEL has been guided by its own members in terms of some of the ambitions they have in terms of working in London and decarbonizing heat from, from the buildings that they tend to operate in or you know, with organizations that they work in partnership. And just to say, you know, a cornerstone of London achievements, very ambitious carbon reduction goals, and the mayor and most boroughs have set uh, very ambitious net zero goals for 2030, 2040, or, the, or at the government's uh, pace at 2050. And the decarbonizing heat agenda is really around the shift away from using fossil gas. And of course, this year, um, I don't need to tell you this, but clearly um, the whole um, uh, situation in Ukraine has raised the whole issue of uh, our use of gas in this country. And it's brought back something policymakers used to talk an awful lot about five or six years ago, which has slightly got lost in the mix in the last few years, which is the energy trilemma, which is not only decarbonizing our energy supplies, but also providing heat affordably to users and ensuring security of supply. And whilst the, the net zero agenda has rightly been looked at, especially last year uh, in, in the run up to COP26, when the UK was hosting uh, the International Climate Conference, some of the issues around security supply and energy prices have been forgotten about, which have, you know, um, been to our, um, you know, there's been a real challenge now as we're facing uh, doubling, tripling, quadrupling of energy prices, the energy price guarantee and everything else that's gone along with it. And of course, we've seen in the, only in the news today about whether or not we need a much more flexible system and National Grid was going to do an offer around flexible supply on the electricity side today, which is decided no longer to do. But that whole issue of affordability, decarbonisation and security supply in the energy trilemma does need to be, you know, a real priority in policymakers' minds. On the heat agenda, um, I've been working on heat issues for quite a long time, but government policy has always been uh, really weak on heat. And we finally saw a first, I guess, major heat report coming out and heat and building strategy in October 2021. And I'll be turning to that shortly. But looking in the context of London, we have approximately 3.3 million homes and much of the discussion about reducing heat and decarbonizing heat has been in the context of looking at homes. But when we uh, had a conversation amongst the members about non-domestic buildings, we know there's something, several hundred thousands, in fact, I think some of the data set that we have suggests there's 700,000 non-domestic buildings when you look at SMEs, offices, and everything else. Uh, and so for that building typology, there really is no clear plan around decarbonizing heat. And so we really wanted to turn the focus on that subset of those 700 old thousand buildings, which uh, the community energy sector works quite closely with to understand after you've done potentially solar panels on the roof, after you've done energy efficiency retrofit, what could you do in terms of decarbonizing the heat supplies? Slide please, Jess. Um, I mentioned the heat and building strategy. I had a look again today. I mean, I, I think many of you remember there was an, an awful lot of discussion about the, the strategy last year because it was delayed by the best part of a year. It's a big tome and it's worthwhile having a, a quick look at again, as I did over the last couple of days. Uh, there's an awful lot in there. Uh, what we don't know, what it would be really helpful if the government published an update to it because there's so much in there, it's very hard to see actually where progress is being made across lots of the measures that have been set out in the strategy. But maybe Kieran can shed a little bit of light upon that afterwards. But just to say the Habs points out there were 30 million, 30 million buildings in the UK, 
heat's responsible for about 30% of greenhouse gas emissions. That's down to the fact that the majority of buildings use high carbon fossil fuels for heating hot water and cooking. And of course, something that you know, many of us know and have heard about on a regular basis, especially with the crisis that we're facing this year, that the majority of the buildings in the UK have low thermal efficiency, which means much of the heat that is generated through boilers in our homes is actually wasted as it seeps out uh, as, as a consequence of poor insulation. And so the main ways to achieve net zero is to improve the energy efficiency of our buildings and switch to um, switch from higher carbon sources of heating and uh, cooling, which is something we'll, we'll feature a little bit later on in the discussion. So do bear in mind cooling issues as well. It may not feel like we need it today, but uh, many of you will of course realize that the UK hit its highest ever temperature this summer time. So uh, how do we uh, look at thermal efficiency? How do we look at heating and cooling and look to low carbon alternatives? Slide please, Jess. Uh, again, I mentioned that thing would be helpful for an update on the heating building strategy because there was a number of different areas of work that uh, the strategy uh, pledged to take forward. Uh, support improvement for owner occupied houses, uh, the mini minimum energy efficiency standards, both for social and commercial industrial buildings. Uh, this pledge around ramping up the amount of installations of heat pumps from the very low level it is at the moment to 600,000 heat pumps per year by 2028. A whole host of uh, plans, strategies, uh, funding proposals and programs and innovation support for hydrogen. Uh, there's vast amounts going on on hydrogen. How much of that will actually uh, support decarbonisation in London's buildings? Um, that's really um, an open question at the moment. Uh, I, it reminds me, and I'm sure somebody might pop it in the in the chat column, uh, that Letty, the London Energy Transformation Initiative, they published, I believe, last year a report about heat and decarbonisation of buildings through hydrogen, and uh, they kind of said there's a lot more effective solutions that are available at the moment in time. Uh, the other issue, which has been uh, an area of focus in London for quite some time, is about how do we grow our heat networks and uh, Kieran will be talking about some of the major new regulations that have been proposed by government at the moment but equally there's a thank you Dave Powers for the Letty that's the retrofit one there's a hydrogen report as well well done, Dave uh, but there's also uh, a number of funding schemes at the moment from the public sector decarbonisation scheme uh, green home green home got local authority delivery which I'm sure many local authority officers will know there's SHDF home upgrade grants and so on and so forth for uh, heat pumps, there's only really the boiler upgrade scheme, and that's only for domestic heat pumps, which uh, Dave will be talking about. And only today we've seen in the papers that there's going to be or uh, a new scheme, Eco Plus, uh, the consultation document for which was issued yesterday, if you feel like responding to it, a one month uh, response time, something you can do just before Christmas. Slide, please. So um, our study, decarbonising heat through community energy, uh, what have we decided to do with this and which Dave will go into more detail? One, uh, we might be wrong in this, but we've decided to focus on air source heat pumps as, uh, as, um, uh, as a technology where we see opportunities, at least in the short term, for uh, community energy groups to actually work to help decarbonise buildings. We're happy to turn to other um, heat pump solutions but at the moment it's air source heat pumps that we've looked at uh, within the scope of this report. Uh, why are we doing this? Well part of the reason why is that groups had already started asking questions at our regular Community Energy London meeting saying how can Community Energy grants from both the local authorities and from the GLA support the uh, retrofit of heat pumps in buildings and so we didn't have an answer to that and I, I think I, it's fair to say even though there have been the heat pump studies undertaken by the GLA, there wasn't an awful lot there on non-domestic buildings. And so we decided to kind of look to see what the potential is, what the challenges were. So um, with the support of the GLA, the scope of the report really kind of highlights what types of buildings and organisations do community energy groups with, i.e. Where, where would they be looking at to put these heat pumps in? How many of these 
buildings that community energy groups work with are there in London? Where can we find data sets which kind of highlight where these buildings are? Uh, what are the challenge of heat pump retrofitting buildings? And it's been really interesting as we've been doing the study, there's an awful lot there about heat pumps in the domestic sector, but very little when you go above that, very little information. And I think the key finding of ours is that, you know, we need an awful lot more, um, a, a lot more data to kind of get groups to be able to uh, really bring these uh, projects to, uh, to, to fruition. Uh, what are the challenges to community energy groups doing these projects as opposed to other actors, you know, uh, uh, installing the heat pump? Community energy groups can bring a wealth of resource, finance, technical ability, support from the community, but it's not terribly easy uh, for even the most simplest projects, just galvanizing all those groups together. So we just wanted to highlight the ch specific challenges of the community energy sector. And importantly, what are the cost of projects? And I, with hand and heart, I can't really say that we've managed to find an awful lot of data at that at the moment, but our report is still in progress and we're going to persevere with that over the coming weeks. Slide please, Jess. So we were looked at, um, we looked at uh, two main data sets, uh, which we won't go into massively in today's presentation, but the report will set it out um, quite clearly. But just to say, uh, we were aided by uh, Mona Khalili uh, from Power Up North London to go through some formidable data sets that UK power networks have published online in the public domain under their distributed future energy scenarios. Uh, if you're not familiar, UKPN are London's distribution network operator. They look after the local wires, not the big pylons, but the local wires that go into homes and businesses. And as part of their five year business plan, they've set out what the potential is across the network in London uh, for connecting lots of new kind of technologies from EVs to heat pumps to solar to storage and so on. And that's a really, really helpful report, but it's quite a formidable piece of um, of data to look into. So we're really uh, pleased that Mona Khalidi uh, took that on that challenge. And as part of the subcategories, there is one for community arts and leisure. And these are the kind of typical buildings that kind of cross over if we had a Venn diagram here in terms of where community energy groups work with. So lots of places of worship, arts venues, community centers, and also we're increasingly seeing some, you know, leisure centers as well, talking to community groups as well as potential opportunities to utilize uh, community energy expertise to help them decarbonize. So the report uses that UKPN data, but also uh, Greater London Authority data as well. And we've kind of tried to make the best um, utilization of those data sets to make some estimates here in terms of what we feel the potential is. Um, slide please, Jess. Uh, on top of that, a separate piece of work that we've been undertaking is looking to see where these buildings are across London. So working very closely with the GLA, uh, we've developed a tool, a map that highlights where all those CAL, those community arts and leisure buildings are across London. And in our first cut, what we've done is look to see what the solar potential is. So by utilizing the GLA data sets for the London building stock model, the London solar opportunity map, and through our other bits of data that we've received from the GLA, we've created this map, uh, which we're soft launching on the 1st of December, uh, this Thursday at our monthly meeting. So. Jess will uh, pop a link into the chat column uh, if you'd like to come along for a presentation on that map. The tool will give you an indication of, uh, well, it'll give you an idea of where the building is. In fact, not give you an idea, it'll tell you where the building is, but it'll also give you an idea uh, as, that, um, uh, as that table shows on the left-hand side of the slide, what the um, potential installed capacity for solar would be, what the annual output would be, uh, what the heat demand of that building is by looking at the EPCs and decks, uh, what the peak heat demand is, and also what the energy rating for that um, particular building is. And you will be able to click on the actual building and that will take you straight to the EPC for it. So the idea is this will provide a wealth of information to identify where those community buildings are so you can start those discussions around everything from energy efficiency to solar to heat pumps. Slide please. 
And just a, a final slide on thoughts about where we're hopeful this te uh, this report can help. But just to say, we're not pushing any one type of technology itself. Uh, our main aim is to, you know, address that issue, the energy trilemma. We want to have decarbonisation of heat, those buildings in London, but we also want to make sure that that heat's affordable and it's secure. Uh, heat pumps is the key technology that's talking about, where, you know, policymakers are talking about, where government is putting support mechanisms, at least for the domestic sector. And so what we're doing is we're trying to explore the potential in London and utilise that as a tool to go and talk to policymakers about where we feel the gaps are if you really want to achieve net zero, these buildings, these community buildings are not going anywhere by 2030 or by 2040. And probably, as you often hear the, the fact, 80% of London buildings will still be here in 2050. So how can we decarbonise the heat for these uh, buildings if there's not the pro pro proper um, regulatory tools there and support mechanisms? As I mentioned before, there's clear deficiency of information around the installation of non-domestic heat pumps. And though we're seeing more data coming through, it's still not that easy to actually find. Uh, luckily, we're seeing uh, an, an awful lot of retrofit in the public sector, uh, mostly through the you know, uh, 2.9 billion pounds that's available through the public sector decarbonisation scheme. And we're really hopeful that local authorities will provide more data on how much those uh, installs cost, what some of the challenges were, and kind of give data on how well they're operating in terms of supply of heat to the buildings and the operating costs. So we, uh, as Cell, will continue to other, uh, explore other options, such as heat networks as well, which is why we've asked Kieran along today. Uh, the report itself, uh, Dave will be uh, our third speaker this morning, and we'll go through some of the findings. And we're hoping to publish the report in the next couple of weeks. There's some numbers that we're just checking at the moment, uh, but that will be available on the SAIL website uh, as soon as possible and hopefully before Christmas. On that note, I think I finished. Are there, I don't know if anybody's been, I'll try and monitor chat as well, but are there, if you mind taking the slides down for a second, Jess, any, if there's any immediate questions if people want to raise their hand? can't see anything at the moment. Jess, can you see any hands being raised anywhere? We have, we have all No, I've clearly stunned people into silence or been incredibly clear about everything that the cell is trying to do here. Um, so what we'll do is we'll turn over to our next speaker, uh, who's uh, Kieran Sinclair from the Association of Decentralised Energy. Kieran, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, or the next one after that as well. Cheers. So um, as, as I've said, um, I, I am the policy manager for Heat Networks at the ADE. Um, so I thought I'd start by just um, giving a bit of a definition of a heat network, what they do, what the idea behind them is, um, in case people don't know. So uh, a heat network takes heat uh, and cooling from one place to another um, through usually insulated underground water pipes. Um, now, this can be, uh, sometimes the energy center is in a building, for instance, for a block of flats, um, and it will power the heating and hot water of all of the uh, residences in that block. Sometimes it's a big energy center, which uh, provides uh, heat and or cooling for a whole bunch of buildings, um, sometimes uh, miles away. Um, it really depends on the size and the type of the network. Traditionally, we call the... Uh, networks that supply heat for one building communal heat networks um, and the ones that supply for multiple bu buildings district heat networks. Um, so why is this better than individual heating solutions, um, for instance, individual heat pumps? Um, for a few reasons, generally, if you have to heat 50 houses, it's cheaper to build one big heat pump uh, than 50 small ones. Um, also, the bigger heat pump will be more efficient. Um, in the industry, they talk about something called the COP, the coefficient of performance, um, which is basically how much um, heat you can move with uh, how much electricity and larger heat pumps tend to do it better than smaller ones. Uh, and also heat pumps can have various sources. Most commonly we talk about individual air source heat pumps, but you can also get heat from groundwater, you can get heat from rivers, um, you can get heat from various things and uh, larger uh, heat networks tend to do that a bit better. 
Um, and finally, um, apart from the ambient heat, heat networks can tap into uh, waste heat um, and carry that over distance as well. So basically the heat that's being uh, created by uh, any of a number of processes from um, energy from waste facilities where they burn refuse to uh, data centers which do cloud computing processing that just otherwise would expel the heat into the environment, that heat can be taken and used to heat homes and businesses. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what's going on at the moment? So the government has committed to trying to uh, expand the UK heat networks market at the moment. Um, it's about 2% of heat in the UK is supplied by heat networks. The aspiration the government has um, is to get, get to 18% uh, by 2050. Um, and the key things that they want to use to do this are the uh, pieces of legislation in the Energy Security Bill, which was originally introduced by Boris Johnson's government, that was two governments ago now, um, and has currently been put on a pause because of all of the political turmoil and particularly uh, the effects of the war in Ukraine. Um, but once the bill comes into place, it will contain two main uh, things for heat networks. The first of which is called the Heat Networks Market Framework. Um, and basically what that means is regulation for heat networks in the same way that the electricity and gas centers uh, sectors are regulated. Um, so in particular, that uh, includes uh, making Ofgem the regulator, just like for electricity and gas, and the independent energy ombudsman, uh, the complaints uh, facility, just like electric uh, electricity and gas. Um, it also improves technical standards and provides consumer protection standards and price transparency uh, for heat networks. Um, traditionally, you might think that the sectors don't uh, necessarily want to be regulated, but actually um, for the heat network sector, we're very, very keen on being regulated um, because this is really, really important to provide confidence uh, to the market at a time when we're trying to really uh, expand the heat network sector in the UK and use it to provide heat to more people. Um, and then another core part of uh, the heat network sector, which Syed asked me to mention is the Green Heat Network Fund, which is basically how we're currently uh, how the government is currently supporting uh, heat network expansion um, and it's basically a three-year um, around 300 million capital grant fund so uh, the government will pay um, somewhere around half of uh, the uh, capital outlay for building a heat network and this can also be used uh, not only to build new projects but to retrofit and expand uh, existing projects with low carbon heat sources. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. And so the other the other part of the uh, energy security bill, which is important for heat networks, is heat network zoning. Um, and this will probably be where um, people begin to experience um, more uh, heat network stuff on the ground um, and in communities is when zoning uh, gets applied. So what is zoning? Uh, it's a policy in the energy security bill designed to speed up the rollout of heat networks. And what it does is it looks at the a certain local area and it looks at the heat needs and the heat sources um, and then it will give a zoning coordinator which will usually be the local authority the powers to mandate connection to certain types of buildings within those uh, heat network zones so basically it tries to where there's heat going wasted and where there are buildings that need low carbon heat it tries to match those up um, and form an efficient uh, heat network within them uh, and it's based on the Danish policy of the same name, which has been very, very successful. So in Denmark, around 65% uh, of uh, people get their heat from uh, heat networks. And uh, our colleagues at the Danish Embassy tell us that 90% of those people haven't seen bill rises as a result of the war in Ukraine and the effect that's having on European gas prices. Um, they're being kept down by their... Uh, effective uh, heat network zoning policy. Um, so uh, the way that this is going to be implemented, as I said, it's to do with mandated connection, which basically means the government will decide that there should be a heat network here um, and what buildings should connect to it. Um, and the types of buildings that it can currently require to connect after 2025 um, will be publicly owned buildings. So that will include uh, your hospitals, um, council buildings, uh, council owned housing, that sort of thing. Um, existing communal networks. So if you're already on a communal heat network that's probably running off a 
uh, a gas boiler in the basement of a tower block. You can be asked to connect to a district network running low carbon heat. Um, what is it? Public new build, uh, sorry, new build. Uh, so any new buildings within a zone can be asked to connect. And finally, non-domestic. Um, so commercial buildings uh, can be asked to connect as well. Um, and yeah, so this is most of the work on this uh, to set out the boundaries has been done and has been put in the energy security bill. However, that is currently on pause. Um, and it was initially paused by Liz Truss's government to try and make it more growth focused, but it's still paused under the latest government. Um, but we are hopeful, and I think we've had some indications from the government that it will be, uh, that it will go back on track uh, next year. Um, and a lot of the detail, uh, in terms of how zoning is going to work has yet to be finalized. Um, so the government is very likely to be consulting further on how the zones will work, who will be in charge of them, um, how they will consult with people on the ground, particularly uh, local groups, um, and also how um, when there is a zone near you, um, will you be able to ask to be connected to that zone um, if you want to. So a lot, a lot of the time, if a heat network has already been built um, and it's going past your building, um, it will be cheaper and more efficient to connect that building to a heat network uh, than it will be to uh, put in uh, individual heat pumps for every, um, every building along the way. So uh, Bayes will be consulting with that probably over the course of the next year and we will be asking um, our members and other people how, um, how uh, they should be required to engage moving forward. Um, and yeah, just a couple of other bits that are kind of quite fresh. Um, so in terms of the uh, bill support for heat networks, um, as some of you may know, um, heat networks are a bit of a, an odd position because technically, whilst many of them um, run, or the vast majority in the UK run on gas, uh, because it is somebody buying gas to then sell on to uh, the individual domestic consumers on a heat network, it's not technically covered by the price cap in the same way that other gas um, domestic connections are. Um, now, the government has chosen a different mechanism to try and give some support to heat network customers, which is uh, taking the non-domestic bill support measures, um, which is called the uh, Energy Bill Relief Scheme, and applying that to heat networks. Um, and that will give some support, but it probably won't be at the same level of the energy price guarantee for other energy uh, consumers. And previously, there was going to be an additional £100 payment uh, to heat network customers to bridge some of that gap. However, um, I think the week before last, the government announced that actually that had just been cut. So it seems likely that for this winter, uh, some heat network customers may be uh, worse off than electricity and gas customers. And we are still trying to lobby the government to, uh, to improve that situation where we can. Um, and I think just, uh, so just, just in terms of the really big picture, um, where do heat networks kind of fit in? Um, and at the ADE, we see heat networks fitting in as part of a uh, landscape of heating technologies um, where there are heat sources and heat needs near to each other. Um, heat networks are usually a good solution for the reasons that I've mentioned, but there will also be places where buildings are too spread out or for whatever reason not suited to having a network. Um, and we think their heat heat pumps will be um, will be a good uh, way of solving that problem, but also there will be a role for hydrogen. And we see that particularly in terms of uh, providing heat for high temperature industries, um, particularly industrials that need high temperatures. So all of these things will be needed in a future decarbonized heating system, um, but heat networks will definitely be uh, an important piece of that. Um, and especially for their ability to uh, run efficiently with large heat pumps and also to capture uh, waste heat offtake. So I think that's um, I think that's basically what I have to say. Obviously, that's a, a pretty uh, short summary of what is a, a big and complicated area that's evolving very very quickly. Um, but I would be happy to take uh, any questions that people have. Kieran, thanks. That's really helpful. And I know that this is an area of work that the ADE has been working on for a very very long time, and the government has been quite glacial on this, and that actually pause in the energy security bill doesn't help. So uh, there's a couple of questions in chat which I'll turn to. I've got a couple myself as well, if you don't mind. Um, 
Uh, but first of all, just before we go into all of that, what's the latest on the movement of the energy security bill? So just to remind people, as you mentioned, this was introduced by Boris Johnson's government. And then when the energy prices guarantee and the energy prices bill came through, it all went on pause. So will we see the bill return uh, to the Commons? Um, it's still in the Lords, actually. It's um, got, got introduced in the Lords because there wasn't enough uh, parliamentary time in the Commons before that. Um, I think we are expecting and hoping that it will be back next year. Obviously, it was the reasoning that we were given um, for it being pulled was, as you say, to fit in the legislation for the Energy Prices Act into Parliament. Um, that's obviously been done with now, and there should still be space in the legislative calendar that was designed, because the bill would have taken probably the best part of a year anyway. So there should still be space remaining, and I think we're hopeful and expect that it will come back next year with some, potentially some bits might be changed um, in some areas of the bill, but for the heat networks, for the heat network parts, they're very uncontentious. Um, the government thinks they're, they're good. The industry thinks they're good. Um, they benefit consumers. So hopefully if those bits won't have any change and should be easy to push through. Okay, well, and one further quick question before I turn to the chat column quickly, uh, which is that local authorities will be given these additional powers. They'll have to employ new people to be these heat network or zone coordinators. So there's presumably a team of people there doing this work, maintaining the data, highlighting where the networks are, things like that. Do they get additional funding to do this? Are you aware of that? Yeah, so and I mean, the, the way that this will actually work is is not set out. So the, the role is called a zoning coordinator. The local authority will be given powers to either fulfill that role or to choose who else they think might fulfill it. Um, and in terms of the way that stuff actually gets implemented, um, it's quite possible that um, local authorities will take a, a kind of hands-off approach, designate where they think a zone should be, and then let developers do most of the work, you know, information gathering, um, you know, putting it into place, project managing, etc. cetera. Um, but some local authorities may choose to be more hands-on. In the act, it does, um, it does say that any further responsibilities for local authorities um, should be given additional fundings under the, I think it's called the increased burdens um, legislation, something like that. So it is, it is there in the act, yeah. Okay, we might have a local authority colleague here on, on, on the call who might be able to uh, elaborate on that. Okay, first question here from Sal Wilson, uh, Kieran. I believe district heat networks uh, across London are currently predominantly running on combined heat and power. Are these being upgraded to heat pumps? Yeah, so the vast majority of heat networks in the UK run on um, gas, gas CHP. Um, it's basically it's it's up to it's up to um, it's up to the owners to decide whether or not they want to upgrade them. The Green Heat Network Fund, as I've said, does um, will provide grant funding up to fifty percent um, of capital needs to move high carbon heat networks, including gas CHP, to low carbon sources, whether or not that's heat pumps or waste heat or whatever other mix. And um, is there anything in the legislation to state that the heat network zoning regulations must conform to a certain carbon content? I mean, because heat networks are only good in terms of the climate debate, in terms of the carbon of the heat that they're actually transporting. Will that be set by the local authority or will that be set within legislation? So there's a whole there's a whole bunch of um different kind of carbon incentives that the general idea at the moment is that if you're so gas CHP is more efficient than just normal gas boiler right um because it, it takes the heat and it generates power um and it's just a bigger machine so it run, tends to run more efficiently um but the general idea is that they have the existing lifespan of the CHPs no new CHPs will be installed because of the way that um various carbon incentives work so once those CHPs reach end of life um they will have to then uh, replace them with low carbon heat sources because there won't be any alternative. Um, the actual mechanisms that they're using to do that are kind of quite complicated. There's this, there's one um, called the stand, standard assessment um, procedure protocol, um, which is how buildings are uh, basically assessed. And that will be a big driver of, um, you know, decarbonizing heat sources for heat networks. OK, um, Paul Hallis, you've asked an, uh, a question about biomethane. Paul, do you mind just uh, turning your camera on and just giving us an idea of what's going on in Manchester, because that sounds quite interesting. Paul? Yeah, uh, th this was just to build on the previous question about, about CHP uh, for, for, for networks, and usually they're sort of supplied by unabated natural gas, which is not especially low carbon. So uh, it obviously depends a bit on the location, but in some if you've got limited space, 
you, you know, we're, for example, in Manchester, we're trying to look at, at, at biomethane rather than natural gas as a way of decarbonizing that system. And, you know, to be honest, we haven't probably not got room to put heat pumps in the, in, in, in the, in, in the um, same location as the CHP engine. So I, I'm just saying that, you know, really for Kieran's comment, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, feels like heat pumps are, are one solution for decarbonizing existing heat networks, but they're not the only one. And sometimes you might have to look at other things as well. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, you know, we can, uh, as I mentioned, look to Denmark where they have um, a whole combination of um, heat pumps, waste heat, gas, CHP, biomethane, biogas. Um, yeah, and there are some, and there are some, um, there are some uh, interesting schemes that already run on that around the UK. I, there's there's one of them, and I forget exactly where it is, but it's in a uh, it's on a it's in a coastal city, and they use the um, old the unused fish remains um, from selling their fish uh, to power a uh, power a bio CHP of some sort. So you can use a lot of different things. Interesting, thanks. And 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 just in passing, I mean, I think Denmark's a great role model to to look at. And as, as far as I remember, in you know, in terms of uh, banks for the buckets, also the leading biomethane market in Europe, as well as the leading sort of heat pump um, company, uh, case country side. Uh, Kieran, forgive me. You've got a couple of more questions, if you don't mind. Uh, you obviously your uh, talk did uh, stimulate a few more questions than mine did. Um, I, I know I will take for future reference. Uh, one of the things you've talked an awful lot about connecting demand side to the heat network. Uh, Rog here has asked about actually the supply side to heat network. So, for instance, if there's an opportunity for connecting a um, combined heat and power, but connected to anaerobic digestion, so a low or near zero carbon heat source. So are there provisions in the bills for actually connecting new heat sources into the networks as well as demand users? Yes, I mean, the undated connection powers in zoning will include the powers to um, connect uh, heat sources as well. That's really, really key um, to zoning is especially where um, heat is being wasted at the moment and it's being pumped into air that that can be captured. Um, again, the details of exactly how that's going to be implemented and making sure there's a fair um, cost um, paid to the heat sources is still being worked out. But yeah, that's absolutely core for the spending policy. Okay. And last question. Uh, you mentioned about, you know, once the regulations are set, the developers might be doing lots of the heavy lifting. Uh, a colleague here, Sydney Charles, has asked, where is the impartial advice to local authorities to ascertain what heat solution is the best and lowest carbon across the borough? Um, yeah, concern that ease of funding big heat networks will be chosen and dictate less carbon savings than could be. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's not always the case that even in the heat network zone, the heat network might be the best solution. Yeah, and exactly how you, yeah, that's absolutely true. And in no one's saying that in heat network zones, 100% of those buildings will go on heat networks. Um, usually there is, there's not really like a negative incentive that would make heat, net heat network developers want to include buildings which wouldn't be efficiently run on on heat networks. Um, obviously, you're working against um, a counterfactual, which would be how much would it cost to install individual air source heat pumps on all of these buildings. Um, in terms of the the other, like in terms of the details of how it works, both individual air source heat pumps and heat networks tend to run on lower temperatures, um, so you still need in additional energy efficiency. Um, but ultimately, it's where can we build the most efficient network um, and where would it be, where are the buildings too spread out or too difficult and therefore would um, be better run on individual heat pumps. But I don't, there's not, it's not really like it's in the heat network developers interest to put lots of buildings on and make an inefficient heat network um, because it, it, it won't run well and it won't reduce prices. Um, and that's kind of the, the core part of the Danish, Danish zoning methodology is that at every stage of the, um, from the heat source to the heat um, transporter to the heat provider, everyone is obliged to offer the lowest cost of heat that they can. Um, and that's kind of what keeps the prices down. Okay, uh, very last point, actually a more, more point than a question, but lots of newer buildings because of the future home standard, the future building standards requirements for more energy efficiency, they're actually very low heat demand buildings. And so actually, I suppose where uh, the, the, the opportunity is, and why we've probably asked you to, uh, to come along today is, is retrofitting existing buildings with all the kind of issues they have in terms of thermal efficiency, connecting to heat networks, and I suppose 
uh, one of the issues that we'll have to take forward as an organisation is where community energy role, <coughs> excuse me, where community energy plays a role in that. And we'll probably be best looking at the regulations as they come forward. Very last thing, Kieran, what do you think the timescale will be for the regulations and when does it, the powers actually kick in for the local authority? So my, my guess would be that the energy, and this is a guess, um, my guess would be that the energy bill finishes up sometime in 2024. Um, zoning legislation was due to come in in 2025. It might slip back a bit, um, although I think Bays are working hard to get the secondary legislation done. Um, but basically, a lot of new stuff is kicking off in 2025. So zoning powers will come into place. The Green Heat Network Fund replacement um, will start off um, in 2025. Uh, and also, there's uh, it's when the government goes through its comprehensive spending review, which is when they basically set the budgets for departments. Um, so it tends to be when bigger spending projects um, kind of get greenlit, and that's also in 2025, as well as also potentially the first year of a new government. Um, so, yeah, I think 2025 is when stuff is going to really kick off. OK, uh, a big note there for our local authority colleagues on the call as well, and, and clearly also for community energy groups to kind of watch the legislation to see how uh, external parties can be involved in consultation in terms of what sets the kind of guidelines for these uh, zones. And I think if I could just say one final thing, um, if there are any uh, local authorities or anybody else who would like more information on this um, or, or anything else, please just do get in touch um, with us at the ADE because um, there's going to be a lot of pressure on we local authorities when zoning kicks off and we understand that and we'd like to support it as best we can. Okay, Kieran, you might want to pop your email in the chat column afterwards yeah. and uh, colleagues, if you want to pick that up on that kind offer from Kieran, please do at the ADE. Um, yeah, an awful lot of things there, including those issues about, you know, uh, carbon content, I, th I think, of the heat is going to be under special scrutiny as we go forward. Kieran, thanks for your time today. You're welcome to stay on on, um, on or leave as, as, as your diary dictates, but that's really helpful in terms of being in contact, and we'll, we'll be in contact again soon after as well about taking these conversations forward. Uh, we'll move swiftly on to our next speaker, Dave Powers. Thanks, Kieran. Dave, over to you. Thanks, Syed. Thanks, Kieran. Really excited about a low carbon heat network. It makes so much sense, doesn't it? Rather than everyone doing their own little bits in their own silos. Um, Jess, if we could have the next slide, please. Thanks very much. So the report that we've um, been working on over the summer and recently, it, like Syed said, is into the potential for retrofitting air source heat pumps in community scale buildings. Um, we've put this report together from studying various reports and literature on the topic, um, and also conducting some surveys of case studies that are either in process for community groups um, retrofitting a pump or have completed the retrofit of a pump. And as we said, the, the scope of the study is more on air source heat pumps but some of the challenges and opportunities that we'll talk about are very relevant to ground source heat pumps, or, or um, as Kieran said, any source of heat, waste heat, um, a body of water, you name it. Um, and particularly something that I'm um, very aware of in terms of retrofit is the fabric first approach to make sure that the, the thermal efficiency of the building that you're, you're tackling is appropriate for what you're doing so very much um, underlining a lot of the research that that came through um next slide oh hold on a minute you are on the next slide <laughs> sorry about this one uh, as you'll probably recognize the the uh, image on the right is the heat map heat and solar potential that um tim will go through on thursday but from our data the ukpn data we found around fifteen thousand community arts and leisure or cal as the abbreviation buildings in greater london this represents eight percent of the heat demand um, from the non-domestic buildings now 95 percent of that heat demand is used um, for space heating in these buildings and only five percent for hot water and 70 percent of the community arts and leisure buildings use gas for space heating so you can see there's a huge potential there to get these on gas community buildings off gas um, because most of the energy comes for space heating. Next slide, please. So the potential we've broken down here 
of those 15,000 buildings um, can be split into the subcategories. It, depending on what the priorities are and the implications, each one is very bespoke in terms of its typology. So the first graph on um, pie chart on the left is the number of buildings split by subcategory of community buildings, whether they're community centers or museums, leisure centers, etc. The middle one shows the total floor area. And the last one on the right is the initial heating demand split. So one could read this and say, well, obviously, leisure centers have got the biggest heating demand. Let's focus on them to engage with. But it might not be the case that they're the, the most appropriate to go after. You could say, well, by number, you could say museums and theatres only take up 10% of the total number, and yet they contribute nearly as much heating demand. You might already have relationships with clubs that you've done solo with, or the community group is, is close to working. There might be a potential to pair up with um, a, a faith group, let's say um, Church of England, for example, that you might be able to tackle a whole bunch of buildings all at once. So there's lots of different reasons why you might identify a potential based on use type, typology, energy, size. Um, and the report will go into that oh a bit later god. as well. Oh my god, my baby. Oh, someone's... My baby. Oh. Oh, I'm going to miss that. I think we've, we've been busted here, Jess. Do you want to mute everyone? Yeah. Sure. Sorry, I'm just trying to find the person. There we go. Sorry, it's difficult to do one screen share. Yeah, all right. sorted. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. Right, so within the report, we focus in quite heavily on the challenges and opportunities of retrofitting air source heat pumps. Um, there are so many challenges, as you can might imagine, um, possibly why these projects have not been the projects that community groups have taken forward in the past. Um, I'll go through some of the challenges here, but I'm by no means to any real extent. You can read them in the report. So I'll pick out some of the some of the key ones here. Skills and knowledge. So unlike solar generation, which is well established in terms of the business model, the supply chain and the grant funding for it, um, there's very little experience um, in community groups or, or anywhere really of um, retrofitting air source heat pumps. The, the types of projects that um, heat pumps associated to are very complex and multifaceted agency for example where you've got multiple stakeholders and complex sign-offs um, means that capital projects that are large often require lots of layers of consent and there can be an incredible amount of inertia when it comes to agreeing a new technology swapping out for example a gas boiler for a gas boiler can be a lot easier decision than bringing along an untested and more expensive technology to be signed off. Also within agencies, agency as a concept, most organizations will have repair and maintenance schedules and they'll be mapped out. There'll be end of life policies. So trying to preempt an end of life policy for a gas boiler, for example, with a new technology will require an even stronger argument for change. Technical. So we talked about fabric first. It's essential that you take a whole building approach to retrofitting an air source heat pump. Buildings that are well insulated, airtight, appropriate ventilation, are most suited and, and we've heard this many times so the counter is also true those that aren't will be more costly to run they'll save less carbon and they'll potentially suffer from unintended consequences um, such as moisture on supply chain and standards finding a suitable consultant to conduct a good quality retrofit assessment is very tricky um, we've had that come through in some of the 
case studies and in some of the reports that I've read. Also, the supply chain, it's very immature. There's not the consistency of policy there for contractors to invest in skills and training. Um, so installing or finding someone to install correctly and commission a system correctly is very difficult on the non-domestic side. There's not as much support for non-domestic installations and finding a trusted supplier. There's the MCS register goes so far. Um, that's a micro generation scheme and um, the trust mark scheme as well. But when you're talking about larger organizations and larger, larger installations, it, there's not quite so much support there to find the trusted um, contractors. On the physical side here, often the first thing I suppose people might think about in terms of challenges is finding a space for a heat pump. Heat pumps are quite large uh, when you get to community scale. Um, if you can't put them away from um, other neighbours, let's say, or, or, or those that could have a, a noise issue, then you might have um, problems with planning permission. Financial. So the financial cost of an outsourced heat pump, as I said, very difficult to find actual costs for this size of heat pump. There's lots of information out there on domestic sized air source heat pumps. Generally, I think it's quite fair to say they're far more expensive than replacing uh, the same size of gas boiler, not just because of the cost of the, the technology itself, but often because of any ancillary work that's needed as well. When I say that, it might be. Um, upgrading the heat emitters, the radiators, or the, the pipe work, the fabric of the building, and also installing it. The cost of installing, we've found ranges, uh, there's a vast range in terms of what's charged. And that's true for domestic as well as, as non-domestic. So the, the upfront cost, the capital expense of an air source heat pump, yes, it is more. Now, um, the government does expect cost parity for domestic air source heat pumps. It hopes to achieve that. But I think the be bespoke nature of these community buildings and, and other works doesn't necessarily lend themselves to the same economies of scale. It's not going to be a like for like high demand um, uh, for the same heat pump to bring those costs down. And, and of course, I can't move out of this section without talking about the uh, the lack of funding. The, there's no boiler upgrade scheme for systems above 45 kilowatts, which all of the case studies we've looked at for this, and I believe most of the community buildings will be bigger than that size of system. There's no rural or urban community energy fund anymore. There's no non-domestic renewable heat incentive anymore. So it's great to hear the heat network, uh, the green heat network grants there, but for individual systems, there's just no, no, no directed support or funding. Um, and of course, trying to make that financial case where carbon savings are significant, if the main priority is financial payback on the capital expense, it's gonna be a much longer time to pay back than for example, solar at the moment. So getting the case through for an air source heat pump and fabric upgrade of your building is going to be much more difficult. Next slide, please. So this, um, Toby, I think is on the call, or if, if not, this is a photograph of one of the case studies, the Devas Youth Club in Battersea, that where Crew Energy installed um, air source heat pumps. Next slide, please. I thought I needed some photos in. This was last night I put those in. <laughs> so the opportunities side, uh, it's not all doom and gloom. There's loads that we can do. Um, community groups have done great work on solar. And I think there's a potential to do great work on air source heat pumps as well. The skills and knowledge that we share amongst our networks through Community Energy London, Community Energy England, and talking to each other is um, excellent. 
uh, we are reaching out to local authorities, as we alluded to earlier, all keen to work together and partner up, create the networks. We've all got common goals. Agency, um, in terms of how you get something through, it's a common thread throughout that having an internal champion at your community building to drive from start to finish is essential. So someone who um, gets the right decision makers on board, keeps them on board right from the start. And in doing that, take them to a demonstrator project and share the experience. There are some out there um, and they, they feel great and they sound great. So take people to see what a heat pump sounds like, um, how it feels inside the building and, and how the users are using it. On the technical side, um, there is always space for a, a hybrid heat pump if you're not, your building is not suitable immediately just to run off an air source heat pump. And the way that works is you might run your existing boiler, say a gas boiler, alongside a new heat pump as a transitionary period. So the gas boiler kicks in when it's very cold and the demand for the heat pump can't, um, can't cope with the amount of heat that it needs to emit because of the, the insulation or the air tightness of the building. We, this has happened in a number of cases, but we see that very much as a, a transitionary stage whilst the fabric of the building is improved and not as a long-term solution necessarily. Um, financial, I think a really key point that can be made is the financial case can be bolstered by phasing it with um, planned maintenance or repair work uh, or combining it with another technology such as low, uh, low energy light bulbs or solar into the business model. I think I saw that in the chat earlier. So those have a more immediate financial payback combining and getting the business case through with a longer term, um, more non-financial benefits um, that will be appreciated, the carbon, the comfort, the health. There's load, loads of that that is beginning to have um, a value placed on it and not just energy saving cost. As I had said earlier, it's worth understanding the cooling needs of a building. So if you're swapping out um, a gas boiler or even upgrading from a direct electric system, which let's say as 100% efficiency and you're moving to 300% efficiency, the, the building may well need cooling more and more, unfortunately, in the years to come. You wouldn't want to be buying aircon units because it, it, it's nonsensical to, to have a gas boiler to heat in the, the winter and aircon units to cool in the summer when you can have an air source heat pump that does both. So that's another opportunity okay should we move to the next slide findings so general findings i found out how a heat pump works uh, so the diagram on on the right hand side a quick reminder as we said earlier one kilowatt for example of electrical power coming in along with capturing the heat from the ambient heat out there of two kilowatts gives you a three kilowatt heat output, so a 300% efficiency there. Um, four bullets then, these are not all of the findings, but big ones that I thought I'd highlight before we go into the last section of recommendations. Very little data experience out there on air source heat pumps. There's no support from the government for community scale heat pumps above 45 kilowatt hours. Community groups have a crucial part to play in facilitating these projects, um, both in terms of translating technical um, documents and consultant reports and supporting community buildings and fundraising. So this, this intermediary role is probably plays down the actual scope of what we can do. And it's really complicated, uh, but we've got to act, we've got to get off gas, as we said, both for security of supply, for cost, stability, and net zero. So next slide, please. 
think I can hear the in installers upstairs doing the solar. So luckily I've got someone managing that for me. I've subcontracted. Um, the three recommendation groups, these are three key actors that we've um, zoned in on that can help support um, and help um, lobby for change and, and um, support these. So next slide, please. First off is the community groups. So a set of recommendations directed at community groups. Upskill, education. Um, we've been doing it. Um, we need to carry on doing it uh, in the technology itself and also the associated calculations of heat within a, a, a building. We talked about standard assessment protocol SAP earlier. The very basic version of SAP is called RD SAP, reduced data SAP, and that's used in EPC certificates. We need to get more advanced than that. You can't run a project based on um, an EPC calculation. You need the consultants in. And if you can do that within your community group, it was one of the recommendations that came out, you're, you're helping, you understand what, um, you're specifying to an installer, you're understanding what spec you need from a manufacturer, and you're understanding why Fabric First Retrofit needs to consider the, the envelope of the building, the air tightness um, and the insulation. Best practice sharing between energy groups across the country, as we said, arranging site visits, partnering with local organizations. So these are the buildings to explore the opportunities for air source heat pump. Finance, there are models. We um, are looking to develop and share models through the Community Energy London website on what works. There's some that don't require any upfront investment. So heat as a service, for example, there are funds out there that we can bid in for on behalf of the community energy groups, such as the carbon funds. And lobbying, lobbying local and central government for additional financial support. Um, one of the, well, it would be great to have a number at the end of this to say we need X pounds to support an air source heat pump retrofit, but it's so wide, it's rather difficult to put a number on it, um, much like the, the 5,000 pound boiler upgrade scheme. I've, I've no idea what, what it would be for a boiler upstream boiler upgrade scheme plus for community um, buildings but we we certainly need something to help with those business models next slide please local authorities so similarly in terms of awareness and education i think local authorities have a unique position where they can take the lead with these demonstrator projects. There are certain boroughs that are already doing this, Waltham Forest, Enfield, for example, uh, with demonstrator projects for a whole house retrofit. That could apply to a community building. Uh, I'm sure that's in progress in some. And once you've proved it in a community building that people are using, they're going to take that back and say, well, I want my community building, I want my faith building. Um, upgraded partnership with community groups as i've said working with local authorities um, we're doing that in hackney um, and i think that's really important that community groups and local authorities partner to to deliver this together in terms of planning local councils are and probably should do a bit more of this um, develop the supplementary planning guidance um, we've got some information from Westminster City Council. They're very, very proactive in terms of developing that guidance. And that guidance will then help internally with the decision making um, to hopefully advocate for air source heat pumps and, and provide the clarity, really, for those um, looking at uh, approving it from a planning point of view. Collaborating, uh, we talked about the distribution network operator earlier, understanding the bottlenecks that might appear in terms of connections or demand, heat demand and, and concentrations of electrical demand. I think um, projects like the local area action plan are really useful in that sense. And funding, there are, there are funds out there um, and bidding in 
and making those funds available for community groups to bid in the carbon offset fund, for example, uh, section 106 um, community in infrastructure level funds, wider funds, in fact, the more funds that you can open up, the better. And finally, educating on those across the different departments within the local authorities. So let's say housing, planning, environment teams, so that there's a, a joined up consistent approach. And last slide, I think something that would really love some direction from is central government. Has it changed? There it is. Um, so there's nothing like political turmoil, is there, to, um, to excuse the lack of progress on, on supporting heat, uh, decarbonisation of heat. Anyway, community buildings need it. We need the source of finance. It doesn't have to be just grants or subsidies. Um, the central infrastructure bank, um, zero cost loans, green mortgages, what have you, the, the various different ways we put um, boiler upgrade scheme plus there. We don't need, um, I, I think we need a lot more than that. Apologies, there's some drilling. <laughs> And I think the point that I'm trying to make in the last sentence there was it is fabric improvements as well. It's a whole building approach. And if you direct the funding just to the technology alone, you're not going to get the results that you need or as much results that you need in terms of efficiencies, carbon savings, money savings. So a, a whole funding package. And behind that, new policies for this place-based, you'll hear that quite a lot, I think, place-based community-led retrofit. Um, it's bespoke and it, it's very specific to an area, but we need policies and strategies that underline that. It's, it's all good having a target for a number of heat pumps installed, but if you haven't put in place the strategy and the policies behind it to achieve that, I, I don't think it'll happen. Last couple of bits, admin, got to make it easy to apply for these funds, both the eligibility criteria and the process um, and keeping it open. Certain funds that local authorities bid for aren't open that long. And if they're not delivered, they have to give the money back. Um, all, all down to domestic applications, the Green Homes Grant, for example, um, or the sustainable warmth grants at the moment, it's got to be easy if, if um, central government want to make it work. Some, the confidence factor is the need, there's been calls for a national retrofit strategy for years, a sufficiently funded strategy. So someone put in the chat the um, Eco Plus and said maybe too little too late. Yeah, I, I would definitely argue that a billion compared to how much is being spent on supporting energy bills that has a zero return on investment. It's a drop in the ocean. It, it's something, but it's, it's not enough. And that means there needs to be a long term strategy to give that confidence to upskill to the industry. And finally, quickly on standards, I said about EPCs need a bit of an overhaul to move away from simply cost-based, which could favor more gas boilers and not air source heat pumps. And the min minimum energy efficiency standards need to be enforced properly. That came out in the Each Home Counts um, review that happened a couple of years ago. Um, and also this quality mark, a quality mark would be similar to a trust mark and MCS. Sorry, I raced at the end. I've got a feeling I'm probably pushing on time, but I haven't got any counters going. So, no, Dave, you're absolutely fine. Uh, that's no problem at all. Tanuja, are you okay for a few minutes while I go through a couple of questions before we come to you? Is that right, Tanuja? Absolutely. Fine. Okay. okay. There are a number of things in there. First of all, just that um, one of the things that's been always in the back of my mind is the comment that Fiona Hughes makes uh, in the, uh, in the chat, which is, of course. Uh, Air source heat pumps are in fact actually very common in some non-domestic buildings. And when you go to a hotel or a gym and lots of other places, you always see them on the roof. They're there, very common. But Fiona goes on to say, so little data is available. And that's been our um, experience in trying to put this, uh, this report together. 
in terms of uh, the availability of data, but maybe we're just making a mistake and not just ringing up suppliers and just asking what their prices are actually, Dave. So maybe we, we need to do a little bit more of that in the kind of, in the tail end of the report, but you're absolutely right. There seems to be, uh, all the focus seems to be in terms of domestic scale air source heat pumps and very little data points around uh, anything else. Uh, there's a good point about uh, by Jeremy Martin. I don't know if we want to come on at all, Jeremy, about hybrid systems um, and in terms of what the, the kind of like um, uh, the weight is between uh, um, how much gas you'd use and how much of the heat pump. But you could probably, I mean, you've, you've made it very clear in your chat column uh, point, Jeremy, but you, you just want to introduce yourself and maybe just explain that a little bit more. And, and actually, have, have um, you know, any interest, uh, sorry, in the information Hackney have on heat pumps in terms of PSDS installations, you've got, we were very welcome here. Jeremy. Hi, just to introduce myself, I'm Jeremy Martin. I'm head of energy and carbon management at Hackney. Um, my previous role was actually doing 20 sites with um, Oxfordshire County Council, where we were principally doing hybrids in pretty well all of them. And it was a mixture of swimming pools, um, leisure centres, offices, you know, you name it. Um, and, 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 and I've done others previously. There are a number of key things with this. Make sure you get the air source heat pump sized correctly. Um, but the point about hybriding is, is really for two um, occasions. One is where you can't move the fabric up sufficiently, um, so you need to be able to get the flow temperatures higher. But bear in mind, you only need the flow temperatures higher on about 10, maybe 15 days a year, um, and, and, unless we're very unlucky with a cold winter. Um, and so if you size your boiler to um, and, uh, to, to to handle about 15%, what you do is you get a quite an interesting um, balance between the size of heat pump you need um, and, and the overall carbon savings. Now, because we do all the carbon savings on averages, it makes it look poor, but in reality, the last 15% um, of, of, of the performance from the heat pump comes at such a cost um, in terms of electricity used that the carbon saving, and unless you're using something like a PPA to knock all of your carbon out, um, that, that, that final bit of carbon saving is, is almost illusory. Mm. And can you give an indication, at least ballparks, on those 20 air source heat pumps you set? Can you give us an idea of what the sizes and rough installation costs were, Jeremy? Oh. Just ballpark? Um, it really varies massively. Um, some of them, the big, um, the big ones were getting on for four or five hundred thousand pounds each in, for, for, for a leisure centre. Um, now in, in Hackney, we've just put in some for uh, the PSDS grant, and three of those are air source, uh, sorry, 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 ground source heat pumps, where we're looking at between two and three million each. At the other end of the scale, we did one office that was relatively new. It, it had boilers in, but it, um, it was a three-story office, housed about 50, 60 people. Um, and I think the air source heat pump was about 80,000. Okay. Um, and, and that was done just with pure air source because it was a relatively modern building. So, it, so we didn't actually have to do anything there. Okay. And any other tips in terms of community groups and um, in terms of taking forward projects? So, I mean, one of the things that we've said is that developing some kind of checklist to kind of work through issues. And, you know, as far as we can see, it's, it's been really challenging to find really good advice about air source heat pumps here of, of, you know, above domestic and below kind of large scale commercial? Well, for me, the number one problem with trying to justify um, changes to, to for, for away from boilers to heat pumps is that there's fundamentally no cost saving. Um, you're doing it for carbon reduction. You're not doing it for cost efficiency. Now, if you've got to change your boiler, what you're, um, so if you've got to change your boiler anyway, then at least you're only dealing with the marginal cost. But again, the, there is no material um, energy saving, not at the moment. There probably will be as gas gets more expensive relative to electricity over time. Um, and, and the current crisis is showing just what can happen. 
um, because at the current gas and electricity prices, there probably is a payback. Um, I, I would expect we're going to go back to normal in a couple of years' time where there isn't a payback. So that's the first obstacle. Um, so if, if you've got to get a payback in order to be able to justify it, then you are really up against it and, 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 and you've got to look for grants. Quite where community energy goes with this, I think, is going to depend on the skills that are available in each individual community energy organisation, um, because this isn't something you should take on lightly. Um, it's really easy to wrongly size a heat pump and end up having to rip it out and, and change it again later or we'll put a second one in running alongside. And again, over the last 10, 15 years, I've seen so many um, systems. I've seen a lot of buildings where um, councils in particular have put in heat pumps and then ripped them out and put boilers in uh, because they just didn't work. And most of that has been because they, they undersized them. Um, now, we're very keen to work with the, the community energy sector in the long term. I really see the community energy sector having a massive role to play in promoting this sort of stuff, particularly with households, because um, I think you're better at talking to people in that environment than uh, we are in councils and that a lot of the contractors are. Um, I think the jury's out on, on whether that goes for the larger buildings as well, but probably because um, we've got more experience in, in, in the larger buildings than we have in the domestic, if that makes sense. No, that's re some really good points there, Martin. That's really excellent. We may, we may come back to you in the future as well in terms of that kind of level of experience you've had. Can I bring in, uh, before, Tanuja, forgive me, can I bring in one other um, uh, contributor here, Martin Crane. Martin, can you just... Uh, uh, provide a bit uh, a bit more insight into the point you, you've made, if you don't mind. Uh, in, oh, in that column. Yeah. hello. Yes, uh, sorry, I, I pressed enter before <laughs> before I, before I meant to. Yeah, so I I do heat networks generally, my dad. But I've generally people size kit on benchmarks, which is just I'm a I'm a consultant, so I'm just as fallible as everybody else. You lick your finger, wave it around a bit, and double it. And you always end up with much bigger plants. And for gas boilers, they don't cost that much, so it doesn't really matter. But for, us, for heat pumps, you want to get the size right because they don't work very well at, at part load, which is what happens most of the time. And they're very expensive. So if you can get half hourly gas data, then you can see what the peaks of the buildings, the actual building heat load is. And I'm saying this because quite often you, within the industry, people don't say that. They don't they don't use don't know that data source exists. A lot of local authorities collect that data and where they haven't, I've managed to get the people who to, who collect it to do it for 650 quid and you get five years worth of data and 650 quid might sound like a lot of money. But if it makes your heat pump a third smaller, that's saving you a lot, lots and lots and lots of money. So basically, if we were working with an arts institution, say, We'd approach the gas supplier and say, "Can we have five years of half-hour gas data?" Would they, but they wouldn't have. No, so historically they might not have it. But even if, even if I've only got it, like if you get it installed, if I've got it installed next week, yeah, in three months' time, I'd have the peak load because it's a good time of year. Um, okay. Okay. Some if some gas suppliers do do it, but everybody should do it because it's fantastic energy management tools. You look at it and you're thinking. Why are all the boilers on overnight? You know, that, and, and so any anybody actually looking after their energy and trying to reduce it should, who can get half hourly gas data, should be using it to actually look at what, what their patterns of consumption are. But, okay. Uh, yeah. There's some really rich kind of comments coming through in the chat column. So uh, colleagues, uh, as you go through, please do continue to do um, uh, provide a bit more information. We'll, we'll collect these, which will all go into the report. Martin, thanks for that. That's really helpful. Um, I'm just mindful of the time. I'm going to turn to our final speaker, just with those words of caution from Jeremy and Martin, echoing the background about being very cautious about data and sizing the air source heat pump correctly. Uh, as uh, Tanuja Pandit and Power at North London are looking at a project in North London in Archway. Tanuja, our final speaker of the morning, over to you. Martin, you mind hitting your camera as well if you don't mind. Cheers. Thank you. So finally, here's a real world example from uh, North London. Um, next slide, please, Jess. So Caxton House is a community center near Archway, uh, multi-purpose building, um, has 
a very good relationship with uh, local residents. Uh, they are, they're in quite difficult circumstances, a lot of them. There's lots of health inequalities and social isolation and so on. So um, this is a building with whom, or a center with whom Power Up North London has had a longstanding relationship going back to uh, 2018 when we installed LED lighting uh, in the center as our, our first engagement with them. Um, next slide, please. Um, just to say that in the context of Islington, where uh, Caxton House is located, um, people are probably aware that, um, like a lot of councils in London, um, Islington Council declared a climate emergency a few years ago, and they have a zero carbon 2030 target. Um, there are a number of working groups within the council working on, on this, etc. So we felt uh, this was an important moment for Power Up North London as a community energy group to work with a, a local uh, center to help to decarbonize the center. And given our relationship with Caxton House, um, this seemed like a good place to start. Um, we decided to take a, a whole building approach to go with the fabric first approach that people have mentioned. Um, a little bit of information about the building in that context. It's a modernish building built in 1976, uh, 1500 square meters, so not enormous. Uh, they have a number of rooms, uh, many of which are used as office spaces. And they have some big community spaces, including that massive sports hall on the, on the right there, uh, which is worth bearing in mind as we go forward, because there are some aspects of that that we had to um, take into account when deciding how to size up our air source heat pump. Um, next slide, please. So in they have been on a, on a journey, as they say, to decarbonization at, at Caxton House. They got their solar panels in early uh, through uh, Islington Council's uh, intervention that was before our time. Um, and those are, are doing a good, good service for them. Um, they continue to do a good service. Um, the lights, as I mentioned, in 2017-18, that was held by an Islington Community Energy Fund grant. And then uh, we, uh, that is Power Up North London, uh, got a, a London Community Energy Fund grant um, early in 2021 and used that to get a decarbonization report done. Uh, we engaged an MEPH consultant to do that for us. And so that, that feasibility report was a key step in us understanding what our uh, journey was going to be with Caxton House uh, in terms of next steps towards uh, decarbonizing heat. Um, Caxton House, when I approached them, um, they've been extremely open-minded all along. And one of the first questions they asked me when I said we wanted to look at uh, decarbonizing heat was whether the fact that they had uh, very poor quality windows was an issue. And I said it was absolutely an issue and is the first thing we should address. And so we did. Um, I was um, very delighted when we succeeded in getting a significant uh, capital grant from the London Community Energy Fund towards the windows. Um, and also Caxton House themselves uh, got some Section 106 money through Islington Council. And um, with that, we replaced all 43 windows in August last year with triple glazed high performance windows. And uh, this work was done uh, through the Green Building Store. We were extremely pleased uh, with the work. It's made a significant difference, uh, not just to the look, but also to the feel of the building and of course to their uh, energy consumption. But that will be revealed as we go forward and as we gather more data on the impact. Um, we, we calculate that uh, over the last few years, the cumulative carbon savings from all of these actions is about 52 tons for Caxton House. Um, so next slide, please. So coming back to the, the role of Power Up North London as a community energy group, and I was working on this slide early this morning and realized, my goodness, it's been nearly two years. It will be two years by the time we complete this project. And there have been many, many phases. Um, you know, a big part of the, uh, the time uh, required to do this is when you, when you engage a technical consultant and they do a report for you, you really need to analyze the information that you've been given in some detail. And we were helped very much by uh, some of the people that we worked with uh, in other community energy groups. Uh, I need to mention uh, Toby at Crew Energy in particular, because 
without Toby's support, I don't think I'd have had the courage to embark on this journey in the first place. And um, you saw earlier in Dave's presentation that Crew Energy have delivered a, an ASO's heat pump at a community center in Battersea. And that was our, our sort of example project that we were um, working with when we, when we proceeded with Caxton House. So just very quickly, because some of you might be quite interested in how we funded this work in some of the stages. So starting from the bottom left, the, the, the sort of start of all this was the feasibility grant that I mentioned. Uh, we got that through the London Community Energy Fund phase four. And we, at the same time, also got the 50,000 pounds towards the windows. Um, next step was um, we, uh, we got the windows replaced, we got the feasibility report, and we also actually um, engaged a, an interesting organization called Energy Systems Catapult to work with us to develop some uh, business and financial models around the Caxton House project. The point that we were uh, trying to um, really um, revealed through, through the financial work was whether there was any scope at all for us to use the savings from the, the heat pump project to self-fund any, any of the work. And we concluded rather like the, uh, the gentleman who was speaking earlier uh, from, from Hackney that really there wasn't a, a financial model in here that, that was workable for a sort of self-sustaining, self-funding model for Caxton House. And that, of course, for community energy groups is very different to what we do with uh, with some of our larger solar rooftop solar installations, where we're able to uh, fund the capital investment through uh, share offers and to repay our shareholders from the income that we get from the sale of electricity to the site. So that is not a model that currently exists for uh, for heat pumps. And when we started this project, Caxton House were paying three times as much for their electricity as they were for gas. Uh, that, of course, has reversed in, in, in the meantime, but we don't know how long that will last. So we're still working with our original assumptions and our original financial models, which led us very much towards getting grant funding for, for this project. And that has taken quite a long time. So while we, once we got the, the, the windows replaced, um, we then were in, in the zone of uh, trying to look at solutions for mechanical ventilation and heat recovery and a building management system alongside the air source heat pump. We got an LCEF 5 grant uh, towards the mechanical ventilation and BMS solutions. We were then still looking for um, air source heat pump funding, and I'm pleased to say that came through um, a few months ago through uh, BIFA. Um, we were also supported by Islington Council because they had to put in some funding for that. Um, and we are now in, in Q4 2022, finalizing the mechanical ventilation quotes, finalizing the, um, the design for the uh, MVHR intervention, uh, finalizing the air source heat pump design and price. And we are hoping to install in quarter one next year. So it's been, it's been a long old journey. Um, next slide, please. So just a little bit of um, what's what's going to happen precisely with the air source heat pump. That's just a, a, an aerial view of the building. You can see the solar panels in front. The heat pump will be located at the back of the building, as shown. Uh, what, what we are doing is going for a bivalent system where we will keep the existing boiler in place for those very cold days, of which there won't be many, we hope, um, every winter. And um, going for a 47 kilowatt air source heat pump uh, the idea is that um, as we make continue to make the building more energy efficient, we can uh, eventually jettison the, the heat pump and, uh, sorry, uh, apologies, jettison the boiler and, and just continue with, with, the, with the heat pump. Uh, the, the mechanical ventilation solution is going to be quite key for us because with the improved windows, there is greater need to optimize um, the uh, air quality around the building. And of course, MVHR will also help with uh, heat distribution around the building. Um, next slide, please. So we calculate that the, the combination of the uh, MVHR, uh, the air source heat pump, and some sort of building management intervention about which I'll speak in a second, we'll be saving about 23 tons of uh, carbon every year at Caxton House from 2024. Uh, I say that's the equivalent of planting a, over a thousand trees every year. So not, not a bad result. 
Um, just for the building management system, um, we did go back and forth a bit with this um, in terms of when precisely we should put in a BMS system. And um, at, we, in fact, with Toby at Crew actually visited um, a supplier of these um, of, of, a, of a building management system. Um, but what we concluded was that the air source heat pump itself also comes with some significant BMS capability. And um, we wanted to put in the ASHP, put in the mechanical ventilation, and then see what uh, remained to be done and if there was some additional top-up support that was required with controlling heating around the building. So that's that's sort of on the back burner for the moment until we, we install the ASHP and, um, and the mechanical ventilation. Um, next slide, please. And this, this is probably in the end, the slide that most of you might be most interested in. So what, what did we learn from this project? And um, as you can see, it's been, it's been a multi-stage project and there have been uh, some very challenging periods. The, the market itself um, is, is quite challenging because it's, it's, it's quite tough to get suppliers to come to the table and to give you quotes. Um, as you can see, we got some quotes, you know, quite a bit, uh, you know, let's say almost a, a year ago, some of them, and then they were updated a few months ago this year, and they went up. And now, now that we are at the final stage of uh, getting the final ASHP design in place and, and the, the final quotes, they've gone up yet again. So we've, we're seeing a 15 to 20% increase in price since we applied uh, for, the, for the grant funding. So there's going to be a need for, um, for us to top that up. Luckily for us, the uh, Islington Community Energy Fund has just come to the table again with their uh, phase six. And what we, are, what we are hoping is that we can uh, fill the gap in our, in our funding through the uh, ICEF six and, and, and thus get to the finishing line. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of technical aspects here that one needs to be aware of. Um, so again, as somebody said, this is not, uh, you know, don't go into this lightly. Um, the seasonal coefficient of performance data, which is the uh, efficiency of the heat pump uh, on an annual basis, is very hard to come by. And there were some massive challenges with our uh, MEHP consultant saying uh, that the air source heat pump would only give you uh, an SCOP of 1.8. And then that was um, challenged by others. And, and so we got quite a range of data. And thanks to the, the brilliance of Mona Khalili at Panel, who's done some fantastic data gathering and research for us, we were able to get to the bottom of that and to, to sort of get to a point where we felt we were comfortable with, the, with that data. Um, the other issue is whether you're going to run a low temperature or a high temperature heat pump. The lower temperature heat pump is more efficient, but um, actually in the case of Caxton House, we've been advised to go for the high temperature system um, given where we are, because that will mean that we're going to start with the existing heat emitters or radiators in the building. And then if we find that some spaces are not heating up sufficiently, then we can replace them on a, on an, uh, on a sort of case by case basis. So that was some of the drivers behind us deciding on the high temperature system, which it then transpired was actually more expensive. The unit itself was more expensive, quite a lot more expensive than the low temperature unit. Um, of course, heat loss calculations are important because you need to understand, uh, you know, what the, the demand is in the building and, and how, how um, heat is, is exiting the building. Uh, but bear in mind that, um, you know, um, it, this, this stuff isn't sacrosanct. There's quite a lot of judgment around the heat loss calculations. And uh, um, that massive sports hall space that I showed you at, at the start of this, uh, we decided to leave that out of our... Um, out of our calculations of demand for the building uh, in terms of sizing up the SO's heat pump, simply because it's a, it's a massive space to heat. It is not heated very often. And on the, the few occasions that they do choose to heat it, we decided we might look for an electrical uh, solution or some other kind of ad hoc solution. So we, we've left a sports hall out of the ASHP calculation. Um, I mentioned the building management system, and that's something that uh, is worth thinking about in relation to uh, air source heat pumps uh, because um, you know th there are lots of sort of behavioral aspects that need to be managed in terms of um, um, users of buildings and that's something I'll come to in a second. Um, and then the system design is is critical. So it's very important that you focus on how the system is designed, 
for the, the particular building um, and, and how it's going to be used. And, and that's something that we are paying a lot of attention to. And the final system design is now in the, you know, we're just sort of within weeks of that happening. Don't forget that people are absolutely key to this. Um, I mentioned Toby at Crew as a key contributor. We also have a, a fantastic lady at Caxton House who runs the, the finance and operations. And without her enthusiasm and willingness to be flexible and come to the table, we couldn't have done this. And of course, Mona at Panel was very key with all the data analysis and research. Um, bear in mind the technical support that's needed at various stages of the project. Um, I reached out to Community Energy London's network several times uh, looking for suppliers, you know, whether for the mechanical ventilation and heat recovery or for the heat pump. And again, that was an important network to tap into. Um, and then finally, when you, when you get that air source heat pump in place, remember that people within the building need to be trained, uh, not just on how to use the, the heat pump. So, so in this case, because it's literally run by two people, this this, uh, this community center, Sue will need to be uh, you know, top of the charts in terms of understanding how to use it, but also the people in the building, because this isn't instant heat, this is, this is slow constant, this is low temperature constant heat, and people need to understand how this behaves differently to, to gas central heating. Um, so that, um, I'm not sure if there's any, uh, there are any more slides, um, just to, finish off. Okay, so that, that was really it. Um, available here to answer any questions that you may have. And I hope you found uh, found that useful. Well, I, I found Thank that you. tremendous for you. So that's just, uh, Tinuj, I speak to you regularly, but even then I, I, I wasn't aware just to the extent of work that this project actually under, uh, undertook. So, uh, you know, that there's some really super excellent points on that, that last slide. There's some comments in the chat column. And also if uh, our colleague who you mentioned uh, several times uh, during that presentation, uh, Toby Costin from Crew is here. It'd be great if Toby could come in as well. But uh, one thing Sydney Charles has mentioned uh, in the chat column is, will there any thought process about uh, the provision of cooling services for uh, participants of that community center over, over summer as needed? Did that feature in your calculations anywhere? Yeah, we've we've talked about um, heating and cooling. Uh, my understanding, and uh, people uh, on the call may have more technical knowledge on this, is that we would need a different kind of radiator. Uh, we need kind of, I don't know what they call fan-assisted radiators, something of that nature. They are expensive. So at the moment, we are not looking at that option, but it's something we could look at in future. I don't think we are, um, I don't think that door is closed to us. So it's just uh, something to bear in mind to keep on the back burner but i think cooling is going to be equally as important as heating as we go forward yeah absolutely and, uh, agree with that sydney fiona hughes made another good point in the chat column thank you for your contributions fiona about uh, she was clearly looking at the graphs a bit more closely than me and so she's a, a single year with the heat pump and, uh, and mechanical ventilation will save half the carbon saved by other measures installed since 2009 so it was just pointing out i think that the the level of the, in you calculating the carbon savings. And again, it just kind of shows you how much carbon contribution is made effectively from the use of fossil use for the heating compared to other any other interventions you can make on insulation. Uh, so yeah, Tanuj, any thoughts on that? No, I, I absolutely agree. Um, in fact, I think those figures are understated because they are based on um, a, quite a low seasonal coefficient of performance as uh, given to us by our um, our technical consultants. What what I'd like to see is some real data after the fact to to, to understand what the what the actual impact has been. So I agree with you, Fiona. It's it's a significant impact from uh, from replacing uh, gas central heating with uh, with an air source heat pump, um, and the mechanical ventilation. We've been told that the MVHR system itself um, will save about fourteen percent um, of. Uh, of energy use within the building, just simply by, uh, because of the heat recovery element, but also the yeah. improved distribution of heat within the building. So yeah, uh, I think there are some big numbers there. Janija, thank you. Uh, I've asked uh, our colleague from Crew, uh, Toby Costin to come in. Toby, you've been hearing the presentations, hearing Dave's work and some of the other bits and bobs that are going around. Any thoughts from you on things you've heard this morning? I was very impressed with everyone's knowledge, really. It, it's great to see groups getting up the curve. So th th that's good. I mean, the thing I'd say, and as to, as you can see from Tanuja's very long journey, these things are difficult. You know, they are very hard and there's 
lots of considerations. You're looking at interfacing with building man management systems that might already be in place and how that works, and, and that's difficult. Um, planning regs can be quite difficult, and, and getting approval. Once you go, go over one heat pump, it, it's no longer permitted development, so you need to consider the, those aspects. Um, that concept of comfort is, is, is a fairly intangible thing, you know, so achieving comfort is quite quite difficult. And you know, lots of people have been talking about the size of the systems and upgrading radiators uh, in this. So again, that's something that needs, needs to be considered. Um, it's the direction of travel. So we do need to get up the curve and we need, do need to learn how to do these things. And uh, I think sort of presentations, like I say, are really important in that. And just our ability to all share knowledge and, and learn as we go along, I think it's equally important. Mm. Thanks, Toby. That, that's really helpful. Uh, your uh, reference to planning reminded me of a question earlier on the chat from uh, Wilfried Riemensberger. I'm not sure if Wilfried's still there because, um, forgive me, Wilfried, I didn't ask your question earlier on, but you mentioned about uh, whether or not any of these heat pump projects are within conservation areas in London. It's a very good point because many boroughs in London are, you know, some people, places like Camden, Westminster, they're nearly 75% in kind of conservation areas in terms of their homes. Uh, what we've been trying to do, Wilfred, as part of this, uh, uh, this uh, personal research work is look across London for supplementary planning guidance, which specifically mean, uh, mentions heat pumps. And I know some colleagues have had some real challenges. Uh, Toby, are you aware of any SPGs or any, you know, uh, either positive or unfortunately negative planning kind of support for heat pumps? Yeah, we're looking at a project at the moment, the Woodfield Pavilion, uh, which is on Tooting Beck Common. And it, it, it's that exact issue. And my, my reading of the guidance is as long as the heat pump isn't in front of the building in terms of the road, then it's permitted development. Somebody within Woodfield thinks, well, maybe we should plan an application in just get that confirmed. So we're, we're kicking that around. But generally, it's a little bit like solar PV, isn't it? If you put it on the back of the house, it's OK. If it's on the front of the house, it's not OK. So these heat pumps, it's kind of hard when you've got a pavilion that's basically in the middle of the field to say what's the back, what's the front and you know what direction people are coming from on a common. But we're looking at uh, putting this. You know, basically, the, the bit that's squeezed against the side path, and I think that that should be fine. Um, and I'd proceed that way because I think it's pretty tough for Lambeth Council to turn around and say we don't want heat pumps. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it, it, it's it's a difficult area, but generally that that's the rule. The guidance I've read from Wandsworth and Lambeth so far, and Merton I think I've looked at, is is exactly that. If if it's not nearer the road than the property, then it should be allowed. Okay, uh, Wilfred, was there something in, in particular in mind or are you in a particular borough in London where you've seen challenges already in terms of planning? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I'm, we, we are looking at the Millbank conservation area, which is basically a 17 block uh, red brick, uh, brick um, grade two listed uh, council estate, uh, also with... Um, over 60 or 65 percent leaseholders, a lot of them absent. Uh, and in the conservation area, the biggest stakeholders, apart from uh, the um, uh, estate, uh, is Tate Britain mm. uh, and Chelsea College of Arts. And um, we, we, we are trying to look whether there is uh, a possibility to work together. Um, there, there are some green spaces around it. Uh, there is obviously the River Thames uh, on, on the other side. Um, and uh, there are some complexities also in terms of the uh, museum and uh, the college having their own contracts uh, running. Uh, and there are certain time frames in there. So I, I was just wondering whether there is um, any any network uh, similar to ours uh, and and with a project. Yeah. Uh, so this is in the London Borough of Westminster, the city of yep. Westminster. Yeah. And uh, that's just really interesting. So just Toby, just quickly, and then I know uh, Dave, you had your hand earlier on. Are you aware of any kind of uh, kind of joining together what Kieran was saying, kind of heat networks and and heat pumps? projects in London or any other city uh, in the UK that you're aware of at the moment? 
No, no, sorry. Yeah, Kieran, are you still with us? I think Kieran may have had to leave. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I know, Kieran, um, uh, Wilfred, there, there's there's very good examples I know in Sweden that Ian yeah. has been involved in where they've taken uh, water source heat pumps connected to area-wide uh, heat pump and heat network projects. I mean, the ADE, funny enough, they're just up Victoria Street. Uh, so maybe I'll... I'll have a word with them and see if they okay. can come for a wander. I'm still, I'm still, I am still here. Sorry, I was, I was just going to oh. say. Um, yeah, Kieran, go ahead. Um, it's, it's something that, um, again, building on the Danish model, um, other countries have done better than us. They have, um, I think they're called municipality heat maps, um, and it's one of the things that because we're working on how zoning is going to be implemented, um, and one of the things that we're looking at is do. You know, we've got this zoning coordinator role for local authorities dealing with heat networks. Um, should they also be required to, you know, do a holistic look at, um, you know, local area heat planning in general? Um, obviously, as I think it's been mentioned, Energy Systems Catapult has got um, has done some work on local area energy plans in Scotland. They're also working on what, what are called the local heat and energy efficiency strategies, which which cover all these bases. Um, I, I think it's. There's a lot of people who are doing good work in this area, but it's a little bit early days in um, finding a solution which is actually going to work, um, and then obviously making sure that it's correctly resourced given pressures on local authorities. Actually, that, that reminds me, Wilfred, there's, there is a, a government um, funding mechanism called the Heat Networks Development Union, HNDU, that offers uh, funding, feasibility funding to local authorities uh, to kind of explore opportunities such as this, where you've got effectively residential, you've got an education establishment with the Chelsea College, you've got the Tate Britain, and you've got the Thames. Uh, if you did a loop around that, you could probably ask Westminster to apply to see whether or not they could get some money from government to actually undertake a, a research uh, project for that. And, you know, that would all be paid for by government. So I think it'll be worthwhile having a con uh, conversation with Westminster officers on that. So have a go at that, Wilfred. I'll, 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 drop, my, I'll drop my email um, in the in the chat column shortly. Okay. And if you want to email me as well. Forgive yep. me, Wilfred, we're, we're coming up to the last few minutes. Of, so I'm going to just turn uh, to my colleague, Jess, as well. But Dave, just so you had your hand up earlier, in the last couple of minutes we've got, yeah, to, just to, any last minute thoughts? Just to build on the, um, the, the opacity of what's permitted development and what isn't, it's just mm -hmm. not clear. Um, planning portal or the town and country planning act um, suggests that for non-domestic buildings there is no permitted development which might not be the um, the impression you get from the local authority planning department or or elsewhere so planning permission yes and much like solar and rural roofs visual harm in a conservation area is a key question and you've also then got the sound as well but that's it yeah, yeah. okay uh listen uh we're, we're uh coming up to the midday um end point for this uh meeting uh and thank you all for everybody so actively uh and positively contributing to the discussion today that's really been helpful it it, it just kind of showed me where we're just scratching the surface at the moment i mean the government has a plan for six hundred thousand heat pumps the residential sector uh, the boiler upgrade um, support system uh, statistics show that we're way beyond that at the moment. And we need an awful lot more kind of uh, policies in place to leverage that kind of increase. Uh, with that in mind, we, we, we'll kind of distill a lot of the stuff that we've uh, heard today, uh, which will go into sales report. But in the very last minutes, I'll just pass over to uh, our project officer, Jess, uh, to just give you some information about Sales new peer mentoring scheme, which provides free of charge support to community groups. Get Jess over to you. Brilliant, thank you so much, Saeed. Um, so yeah, I'll just do a whistle top whistle stop tour um, of our new cell peer mentoring program. Um, so we launched this actually just last Wednesday, um, and Saeed will hopefully pop this link in the chat to our website here. Uh, but I'll also be sharing the slides after this event as well, so you'll be able to access it there. 
And this peer mentoring programme is really available to any um, community led energy projects happening in London. Um, so even if you're an organisation kind of outside of London, but you're looking at doing a project in London, you would be eligible for this. And we have 40 mentoring sessions available over the next three months. We'll be reviewing our applications on a fortnightly basis. So they'll be running over the next three months. Um, we won't kind of be waiting till the end of that period. And like I say, we have 40 available. So plenty of opportunity for groups to get their sessions in. And we will be showing you the mentors just available here. So we have had Tanuja, Toby and Dave on the call here today. Um, so we definitely have expertise in heat if you are interested in doing a decarbonised heat project. Um, and these expertise are available in a range of areas. So if you're interested in business and finance, if you want help on low carbon technologies, even if you're doing something different like delivering energy advice, um, we have a range of expertise available. So please just do visit our website. Um, we've got an application guidance document on there that kind of runs through the expertise of all of the individual mentors and kind of tells you how you can make your application. And then there's a accompanying application form for you to fill in. So just run through that very, very quickly. So if you do have any questions, please do email me. Um, my email is officer at communityenergy.london. And just to say, this will also be running about concurrently to round six of the London Community Energy Fund that hasn't been released yet, but we do expect it soon, hopefully. Um, so this can offer kind of support for any of those applications as well, if you wanted to get an application in for that. Thank you, Jess. And that's a really good point. Uh, just to mention the London Community Energy Fund. So we're hopefully anticipating round six of the London Community Energy Fund to be uh, launched any day now. Uh, we'll be providing details of that as soon as the GLA do announce that. It's £700,000 of support for feasibility, pre-feasibility capital and also operational support uh, in terms of groups wanting to develop a project. So hopefully um, some participants on today's call may well want to bid into that to actually get some funding for their own uh, source heat pump retrofit project. As I mentioned, that report that Dave, myself and some other colleagues, um, uh, Mona Keneally and, uh, and several others, including Toby, have been working on, uh, that will be published in the next couple of weeks. Uh, you know, if you have any thoughts, please do just email either Jess or myself uh, and we will make sure we pass those on to the authors. But uh, I think that just leaves me to say now, thank you to all of our speakers today from Kira <laughs> from ODE, uh, from Tunisia from Power Up North London, uh, from Dave Powers from Heal, uh, and Jess as well for organising all the event. Uh, the slides and a recording of the event will be available on our website. If speakers could stay for just two, three minutes uh, after the close of the call, that would be really helpful. I promise we won't keep you long. Uh, but otherwise, uh, we'd just like to close the session today. Thank you very much for your participation. We're going to continue to look at the issue of heat pumps in 2023. As I as, um, just as mentioned, we have monthly meetings as well on the last Thursday of every month. Ever, all the details are on our website, communityenergy.london. Thank you all. We're closing the session, but speakers, if you could just hang on for just a couple of minutes, that would be great. Thank you again all. Bye-bye.